good Friday morning to you. Uh, this is uh, our last, uh, our last, or our first Friday uh, doing our morning program here for the Preterist Power Hour. I know it's our last day of the week, uh, Edward. I'm sure uh, you're as excited as I am that uh, we completed a full five days, a full first week of 11 a.m. Uh, podcasting uh, every day. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts, of course, as I ask you every morning. And um, you know, I, I've appreciated this time. Uh, I was getting to a point where I was excited because I began to think, wow, this is going to be great. I don't have to wake up early on Saturday morning to uh, to do anything. You know, I have a day to relax. And as you know, Edward, that's not the case. We have 9 a.m. Bible study. And then, of course, we have 9 a.m. Bible study on Sunday morning. So a week chock full of waking up early and talking about the Bible. Glory to God. And uh, so that's, that's the story. Uh, I'm Mike Miano. I'm pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church director of the Power of Preterism Network, which I actually am hoping to get some opportunity to talk to you a little bit about today. And uh, I'm excited to be here for what I like to call a flashback or flash forward Friday. Uh, Edward, good morning. And uh, please introduce yourself, uh, to share, with, share with us some of your uh, thoughts in regards to this Friday, our, fi our fr first Friday being here, and then lead us in a word of prayer, if you don't mind. Okay. Good morning. My name is Edward Howell. I'm a member of the Blue Point Bible Church, and it's an honor and privilege to co-host with Pastor Michael Miano. And this week has been a very fruitful and edifying week. You know, um, I get to share some of what I know and also receive knowledge from Pastor and the guests in which, you know, that we've been having, you know, and getting through the first week, you know, gives you and gives us an idea of, you know, how it's going to be going. And it has been going very well. I think we've been having a wonderful time in the Lord, you know, learning and gleaning, you know, from the manifold wisdom of God, from, you know, speakers and uh, resources and things of this nature. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll now lead us into prayer. Heavenly Father, please go before us. Uh, open our eyes, ears, and minds to receive that which you have uh, for us today. Uh, in concluding this week and, uh, you know, uh, guide pastor and give him clarity of thought and focus that uh, it will provoke people for discussion and conversation and, uh, you know, edifying and empowering those that are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, I agree, brother. I think that uh, it's been a very fruitful time. I, I'm happy about the 11 a.m. decision. I think uh, while I joke and, you know, I, about finding the, the place uh, within my schedule in the morning waking up, I, I totally think it to be a privilege. And again, I, I always appreciate your consistency and your diligence uh, in joining me and in being a part of this discussion. So uh, as I joked with you off the air, uh, you know, summarizing the mark of the beast, Imagine if we could just summarize the topic and we'd be done with it. Uh, you know, the, obviously we know that not to be the case. Uh, I'm sure that the mark of the beast, as though we're going to try to conclude on this topic today, uh, it, it's going to continue to be a discussion. Uh, there's going to continue to be people that are asserting different things to be some sort of futurist uh, mark of the beast beyond the context, the biblical historical context that is available to us in the scriptures. Uh, so, frustrating, but encouraging that we're moving in on a sort of running resource here of uh, things regarding the mark of the beast. So uh, I'm excited to kind of jump in on these things, Edward. And uh, first thing I want to do is just uh, bring us back to some thoughts regarding yesterday. So we had Johnny Ova on the program. Uh, again, a very fruitful week. We had Johnny Ova. We had uh, Holger Neubauer. Uh, we had ourselves, of course, uh, here outlining the topic, and we've had many guests joining with us. Uh, so uh, this has been a, a good time. So, you know, uh, Johnny brought up quite a bit. I don't know if there was anything you wanted to uh, mention uh, from yesterday that uh, you might summarize uh, some points that you pondered after the program yesterday, Edward, but I'd want to go ahead and give you the opportunity to do so. No, I haven't really, you know, thought, you know, deeply about uh, yesterday's podcast. You know, okay. I, I was just like coming down from <laughs> from the week. You know, right, a lot of information. Well, yeah. if I may, uh, I'll bring your thought back to something that we had just been talking about was obviously Johnny pointed out that in preterist circles, there's the need for us to not necessarily rush to what we might think will fit. 
the historical parameter or maybe some historical information we have heard. Uh, obviously, Johnny pointed out that yes, there are historical writings that say uh, that refer to Nero as a beast. And he was a beast, you know, by biblical, you know, the biblical definition of carnality and worldly empire, he was a beast. However, that doesn't mean that he's the beast that fits in the parameters of the first and the second beast uh, of uh, Revelation 13 or Revelation 19 or any of that. Uh, he might be a part within that system, which, as you know, I, I talk about. Uh, however, I don't believe that he and what Johnny had pointed out for us was that there needs to be other things brought into the discussion. And he had mentioned a doctor that he's gonna share at a future time some resources from. Obviously, we're gonna wait on a blog from, uh, fr from him in regards to the Mark of the Beast that he had promised to post on his website. But Edward, uh, you know, just returning back to that topic, I think you've seen the weight of the, uh, and you had mentioned with me off air, uh, you've seen the weight of re-examining what we're saying in regards to the beast being Nero and the Roman Empire and uh, things in that regard. Would you mind sharing maybe something about that? Sure. Um, with Nero and the Empire, you know, um, like like we understand, the Romans had had their part, um, but so did the uh, the the Jewish leaders, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, that were persecuting and you know killing Christians and things of this nature, and they could not have done that without the Romans. And the Romans uh, really could care less about you know the Jewish people unless they caused an uproar, which the Zealots had done, that caused their attention and caused the I, I guess the Roman and Jewish war. Um, but uh, let me see. Oh yes, and and what. Um, the gentleman um, Johnny was speaking about, as far as uh, I, ha I had, I had the thought of, about um, Christians, or 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 what? What did you mention originally about um, um, Johnny's topic about the Jewish? About now how it's not necessarily Nero that we need to be careful that you know, when we, we just kind of assert that it's something that might fit because it said Nero was a beast, that that might fit the uh, param the, the that historical That brought me back parameter. to my thought. Okay, he, you can't um, give too much emphasis on gamatria. Like he said, you know, balance is necessary because mm -hmm. if, if you put too much on gamatria, it does not fit the uh, historical or the biblical narratives. You know, if you put too much on an, on a gamatria, gamatria may have its place, you know, but you can't put too much on it. You know, it like like to rely on gamatria. No, you cannot do that. You know? Right, and, and if I may just qualify, there's two things I wanted to mention about what you just said. Uh, the first thing about what we're saying about gamatria, Hebrew gamatria is a Hebrew form of numerology. Now, numerology has many different forms in many different uh, civilizations. So what people might often see today is people doing all this crazy stuff with numbers to, to equate to 666 or, uh, you know, to find numerical times and, you know, different things like that. Uh, one would be the, in Daniel, you see a reference to 1,260 days, 1,335 days, I believe the other one is. So you see these people doing all sorts of math and different things with numbers, numerology, playing, you know, the study of numbers, the science of numbers. So what we're saying is Hebrew gamatria is a valid historical thing. Uh, the, the Hebrews did believe in it. They did utilize it. They did speak with it. Uh, you know, we, Edward, I thought you brought up a really good point about uh, our modern understanding of geometry uh, coming from that root of, uh, of this whole, this concept here of, of gematria. So yes, it can be valid, but we need to be careful with it. Just like numerology can be valid, and, and we, but we need to be careful with it. Uh, so that being said, uh, I think that's a good point that you brought up. And the second thing I wanted to highlight was uh, in talking about how the, the, the Jews and the Romans were both a part of that historical scene there, the beasts, so to speak, against the people of God. And uh, what I think is important to note is just as much as we're saying, be careful with how much emphasis we might place upon Nero, because again, we know there were other parts of that. You know, there's uh, the, the Vespasian and Titus uh, and all the other rulers that were a part of the, the, the Caesars and the Roman Empire. Then on the flip side, 
I think we're also realizing we need to be careful with characterizing any certain Jewish influence. Like, for example, some people place a lot of emphasis upon the zealots, which, again, I believe were very much a part of the Jewish beastly influence in the first century. However, we also know, as Holger Neubauer points out, the high priest was a part of uh, that beastly empire. And let's say the Pharisees and the Sadducees were a part of that beastly empire. So, uh, you know, again, so we see Jewish beastly empire with horns, meaning different pieces that are a part of that rulership. And then on the flip side, we see Roman beastly empire with different horns or different influences, such as rulers, etc. So uh, my brother and I, we talked this through yesterday as we studied through Revelation chapter 13 and 14. So uh, you know, again, I think that's important, important to place emphasis upon, upon being careful about how we're making specifics out of the details that we find in both areas, the first beast, uh, the sea beast, so to speak, and the land beast that we see there in Revelation. Okay, so my understanding, I don't know if I'm correct, and, and you, you're going to have to elaborate and correct me in this, you know, it's a stretch for me, but I'm seeing the sea beast as the Romans, the lamb beast as the Jewish uh, leaders and the zealots as the man of lawlessness. That sounds, you, you might very well, you know, again, I haven't uh, nailed these things down. As I've told you, uh, I'm still kind of working through a good understanding of Daniel. I think what you just said sounds very plausible and very uh, accounted for. Uh, if we, you know, I think there are proof texts that you and I have read through and studied through. Yes. We see where that can definitely be the case. Second Thessalonians, for example, um, you know, many things in that regard. So, uh, again, uh, yes, that could very well be the case. And I, I'd tell you to uh, hold on to that, lean into that study. And, uh, you know, we're going to mention some resources. The study, as I mentioned, is not going to end here. Uh, this is just our last of obsessing about it here on the Preterist Power Hour. But uh, again, I imagine we're going to continue study and we'll keep the study going over there at uh, the blog site, powerofpreterism.wordpress.com. Uh, right now, I believe the blog is titled Mark of the Beast uh, Podcasts and Resources. So you can go there and you can get different podcasts from us here at the Preterist Power Hour, as well as the various resources we have been mentioning. We'll mention again today and highlight. So uh, good job, Edward. I definitely uh, think you're, you're leaning in on that uh, well. So if you don't mind, uh, maybe we'll add some uh, meat to that uh, as we look into some more text this morning. Yes. Uh, I wanted to bring us into some surrounding texts. Uh, again, Revelation 14, uh, Revelation 16, and Revelation 19, and, uh, and deal with some of that. So uh, let me go ahead and open up my notes here. So now, as many of you know, I wrote the commentary for uh, Revelation chapter 14. And what I'm going to do, if you'll just let me bear see with me. see if I have that book. <laughs> I wrote the commentary for uh, Revelation chapter 14 in Spirit and Life Lectures 2018. Uh, we've also offered that if you share this podcast, either the YouTube page or the um, or the uh, Facebook page here, Facebook uh, video, if you share it on social media, that you can have the opportunity to win a free copy of Spirit and Life Lectures 2018. So I'm opening up my Bible to Revelation chapter 14. And then I'm also opening up to page, uh, if you do have the book already, uh, to page 169 of Spirit and Life Lectures, which is my commentary. And I'm going to sort of bring us through some things. I'm not going to bring us through word for word, of course. That's the goal for you to get the book. Obviously, as we've already mentioned, uh, Holger Neubauer wrote the commentary for uh, Revelation chapters 12 through 13 in that same book. So right away, when we get into Revelation chapter 14, Again, so we've been talking about the beasts uh, in Revelation 13. Now, when you get into Revelation 14, it says this. And I looked and behold, the lamb was standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his name and the name of the father written on their foreheads. And of course, this is the coming of the Lord. This is where now you had that time of tribulation of these beasts uh, doing their work, having their way uh, in the world and then the coming of the Lord. And we see the book of Revelation is full of what we call recapitulations. And recapitulations are these repetitive stories being told, uh, not necessarily in chronological form. Uh, they're akin to how I've often explained it, is standing in a room with various doors. When you go into the different doors, each door gives you a picture. The, the pictures are not necessarily in order, 
but they're giving you a picture about a certain topic. Here we know it is, is a whole picture about uh, Babylon and the destruction of Babylon, the destruction of Satan and the powerful coming of the Lord. Again, the very title of the book of Revelation, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, the revealing of Jesus Christ. So uh, that being said, Revelation 14 is a very important text because it's leaning in on what this coming of the Lord ultimately was to accomplish and what it was going to do. So we see the elect, this very seal of God, uh, as most biblical commentators across the board seemingly agree, uh, this is what's being made known in this text and the judgment. So after these beasts have their way, the Lord is going to come. He's going to save his elect, those he had sealed, and he's going to bring forth his judgment. That's the story. He's going to gather with him uh, those that were his, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, resurrect the dead ones, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So uh, again, I mentioned the commentary I have uh, on Revelation chapter 14. Uh, also, uh, if I may take the opportunity to just mention, uh, yesterday we were, met, we were uh, brought up in a local newspaper, Suffolk County News, uh, and I was quoted for saying, it's not the Bible through the lens of the newspaper. Uh, and again, uh, I believe Part of my journey to preterism uh, brought forth clarity and healing uh, as I came to accept full preterism and came to realize the true context of what's going on in Bible prophecy, rather than my obsession uh, to move to the mountains, you know, and, and begin this compound that was going to wait for the last days, you know, and again, it was a very real thing. Uh, I don't say that to mock people that hold to that view. I don't say that to mock myself in my former view. It, you know, I say that to demonstrate that it was not an easy journey in study nor may I say in life, in ministry, uh, to come to the truth of full preterism. And uh, in Revelation chapter 14, I actually cite uh, in my commentary uh, on the book, on chapter 14 in the book, I cite George Washington. George Washington says, truth will ultimately prevail where there is great pain to bring it to light. So uh, those of you that know me, uh, I my big part of my ministry, and this is again, a part of the commentary that I offer up, it's part of audience relevance. Uh, some of you that know my ministry a bit more closely know that I teach that uh, audience relevance is not just a Bible study principle. It's a reality. It's, it's something we need to have in our real life. Uh, you know, so I think it's important to understand where I'm coming from in my teachings when I'm teaching. Uh, that way you can better understand the truths being brought forth. So that being said, one of my obsessions, which I believe was the obsession of the Apostle Paul, uh, as he explains in Romans 10, is to bring forth a zeal empowered by knowledge in contrast to what often pervades our culture and that culture in the Bible times, a zeal for God without knowledge. So again, I believe it's important for us to really study these things through. And that's what, what I do, you know? So uh, one of the things I offer right at the very beginning of this commentary is a correlating verse chart where you actually have to do the study. You have to lean in. If you really want to understand this stuff, you have to do the legwork. And what I, I have it in the book, but I also have a blog that I'll share as a sort of summary for this, uh, this podcast program. Uh, I'll share my correlating verses chart that was available on the power of preterism dot WordPress site a couple months, a couple of years ago, matter of fact, in 2018. So I'll share that with everyone and make it available uh, as a resource. And uh, that's important, you know, so I say all of that because we have to develop the foundation of actually doing the study if we want to actually have biblical responses to these things that we're talking about. So as I mentioned right here, chapter uh, chapter 14, verse one, it's the coming of the Lord. And again, if we notice, uh, you read Matthew chapter 24, you read about a time of tribulation. And then what's going to happen after the time of tribulation? The Lord's going to come and gather his people. So that's exactly what's happening here in Revelation chapters 13 and 14. Is that exactly, well, if I may, I would say from Revelation chapter uh, 13 all the way through to Revelation chapter 19. It's the historical picture of 66 to 70 AD. It's the historical picture of the judgment happening and the Lord coming to save his people, the coming of the Lord. So, uh, Edward, you probably heard some confusion in regards to the 144,000. Mm -hmm. uh, many of you listening probably have heard, uh, you know, some confusion. This is just as confusing of a topic and has been used to confuse people as much as 666 has been used to confuse people. So, uh, as I mentioned here, if you turn with me to page 171 of the book, I mentioned right here in my commentary, I say, this need not be the case. 
I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. This need not be the case if we properly frame the narrative of Revelation and understand the context in which the details find their fulfillment and how the details would have been understood through Jewish gematria, numerology, as we were just talking about, and use common sense regarding those who received the text and thus could read, hear, and keep the things that were written. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, because the time was at hand. Being first fruits and singing a new song, which is what this 144,000 do, offers glimmers of clarity. The primacy of Judean believers in accepting the gospel is noted in Jesus Christ explaining who he came for, Matthew chapter 15, verse 24, and further detailed by the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans. For example, in Romans 1, 16 through 17, we read, for the gospel is salvation to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Furthermore, in Romans chapters 9 and 15, the apostle goes to great lengths in explaining that the promises were made to the Israelites of the flesh, and that as the promises were finding their fulfillment, and many Israelites of the flesh, including but not limited to the Jews, were coming to see Jesus Christ as fulfillment of Mount Zion. The Gentiles were being saved and glorifying God for his mercy. As Steve Gregg notes in his commentary on Revelation, what we see here with the 144,000 is the, quote, Judean believers standing secure with the Lord in victory. These first fruits are also contrasted with the multitude of Revelation chapters, chapter 14, verses 9 through 17, which is seemingly the same group mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. These first fruits, so again, if you notice there, if I may just inject, you have first fruits and then you have the multitude. You have the Jews, you have the Gentiles, you have the land, you have the sea. Again, it, it, the parallel is just amazing. These first fruits sing a new song, which means they have a new message or revelation from God in their hearts. And I offer up citation of Psalm 40, verse 3, Psalm 96, verse 1, and Psalm 144, verse 9. This new song is reminiscent of Isaiah chapter 12, verse 10, a song of forgiveness, deliverance, and victory, and calls the Jewish mind back to the singing of the song of Moses in Exodus chapter 15, and highlighted in Revelation chapter 15. Prayerfully, each of us are convinced that this new song is the revelation of God's new covenant through the fulfillment of his righteous acts. It is this Hebraic Jewish-focused remnant that is the focus in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 24. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of the all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant into the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So again, this is our 144,000. It's the Jews that were accepting the gospel, that at the time of the coming of the Lord, there were 144,000. There were, and again, the math for that, most of us know it. Uh, there's a bunch, you know, 12, you see 12 as a symbolic number of completion. 12 was obviously the number of the tribes of Israel, which again would bring them back to the completed tribes of Israel. And what we know about the Judean church from history is that what did they do when these beasts began to have their way in 66 to 70 AD? Edward, you know the answer to that. What did the church in Jerusalem do? They fled in to Pella. That's right. They were saved because they heeded the word of Jesus. That is the reflection of what we're reading right here in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. That is the 144,000 that were standing with the Lord, the Jews that were standing with the Lord in Mount Zion because they, they heeded the word of the Lord. So again, it doesn't need to be confusing. It's just we have to put all of these things in their proper context. As we continue in the text, we read about these three angels in Revelation chapter 14. I say this here uh, on page 173. Throughout Revelation chapter 14, we read of angels offering shouts of details regarding the impending judgment. As noted above, uh, Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, once the everlasting gospel is preached to all the world, the end shall come. The everlasting gospel, the gospel of his everlasting kingdom, the one of hope, the one hope, 
of Ephesians 4.4, 4, is that which was hoped for throughout the ages and accomplished in Christ Jesus. We read that in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. The end of the age announcement highlights that at this point of impending judgment, the gospel has been preached to all. Sure enough, we find evidence within the New Testament that by the time of the latest writing, 68 or so, the gospel had been preached into all the world. And I offer all those citations that many of you tuned into this program are familiar with. And that's what we're reading in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. For the hour of his judgment has come. That's the end that Jesus said, when this gospel has been preached into all the world, and then the end shall come, the judgment. Failure to understand the context of the Great Commission has led to the postponement of this judgment. Erroneous teachings that has led to the third three angels' understanding of the seven-day Adventists. The mission, and I, I give a quote here from the seven-day Adventist website, the mission of the seven-day Adventist church is to proclaim to all people the everlasting gospel in the context of the three angels' messages of what we should be teaching. Fear God, the commandments. Babylon equals the modern-day church not operating under the Sabbath. And the mark of the beast is Sunday worship. Again, I, I published our study, uh, which we actually did more recently with the Seventh-day Adventist, where we actually sat there and listened to the specifics. Interestingly enough, and Edward, I don't know if you knew this, I wrote this before we went there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is back in 2018. So uh, I had previously been aware of their teaching. However, we were patient and were willing to listen to their study. And then what I do uh, with the rest of the, uh, the portion here is I, I get into the eternal gospel. So let's consider these three angels. And Edward, I'll, I'll take a breather here if you have something you want to share. Uh, <clears throat> with three angels, uh, the first angel uh, is this declaring the eternal gospel has been preached. The judgment has now come. The second angel is the fall of Babylon, which again, if you rightly identify mystery Babylon, which we've leaned in on quite a few times now, uh, then this becomes clear. So the second angel begins to declare the fall of Babylon. So you have the eternal gospel has been preached. Jerusalem is now going to be destroyed. And in the midst of this story, you have that mark of the beast. So you have your context right there. Uh, it's the time of the first, end of the first century. And the mark of the beast, if you turn with me to page 174, I basically just offer up some texts and uh, I say there's more to be said and revealed in a commentary on Revelation chapters 16 and 19. This is on page 175, sorry, regarding the mark of the beast. Speaking of those who receive this mark, which is no more literal than the seal we spoke of concerning the redeemed in verses one through five, rather means to be obedient to and do the work of. Speaking of those who receive said mark of the beast, the text says, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Instead of understanding this in context, clearly speaking of the kingdoms of that time, Roman influence and 666 is interesting. Many have offered up all sorts of things from working with the United Nations today, drinking monster energy drinks, and so much more strange teachings. Uh, and then again, I offer up the context of the uh, the Roman Jewish war, and ultimately the need to search out the details of the mark of the beast within that period of time. And, uh, you know, I get in on the coming of the Lord on page 181, but I'm, I'm going to breathe there. Uh, on page 181, I get in on the, uh, the topic of the coming of the Lord again, uh, and I give you more details because again, in first, verse 14, if I may just read that, uh, and I looked and behold, a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like the son of man, having a golden crown on his head and having a sharp sickle in his hand. So again, uh, just to kind of conclude my thoughts here, Revelation 14, verse 1 starts out with a picture of the coming of the Lord. And then what we're ultimately seeing by the time we get to verse 14 is a recapitulation, another picture of what the coming of the Lord is going to look like. So you're getting various pictures of what the coming of the Lord is going to, uh, the majesty and the glory and the judgment that is going to come with the coming of the Lord all throughout this text from verse 1 up to verse 14. What do you think, Edward? Good outline so far? Very much so. All right. Does the, did the three angels make sense and help us better understand maybe some of the things, the misunderstandings that uh, the, we saw there with the seven-day Adventists? Oh, definitely. Definitely. All right. Well, uh, 
And again, obviously tonight, I'm going to be talking about the coming of the Lord. Uh, just a reminder to everybody uh, tuned in tonight at 8 p.m. I'll be uh, doing a discussion uh, with someone who does not agree with the teachings of preterism. However, I'll be doing a discussion with him in regards to has the coming of the Lord already occurred? If you go ahead and look on the screen there, I'll show, there's the graphic. It will be live on the Kingdom in Context on YouTube. And again, that's at 8 p.m. Eastern tonight. I encourage everybody to tune in and uh, let's uh, see what sort of discussion can be stirred in regards to their misunderstanding of preterist teachings and why they might refer to them as doctrine of demons. So uh, that being said, um, the next thing I think of importance here in this text in Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, that I like to bring up is where it says, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Now, again, I think this is something that's been fundamentally misunderstood by most Christians. Leading up to the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, the influence God was using to lead people was the Jewish religion, was the Israelite religion. And in that religion, they had the law of Moses. The power of the law of Moses was the temple. That's why Daniel talks about the power of the holy people. So under that system, you were believed when you died that you would go to Hades or Sheol, the Hebrew phrase, Hades being the New Testament Greek word used. And you would go there and you would wait till the time of judgment. Now, again, within Jewish thought, within the, you know, the Israelite thought there, uh, there's been different offerings of what goes on in Sheol. Now, the Bible seems to allude to the fact that they sleep like, you know, those that would be asleep, they're not alive. However, there has been thoughts. Josephus, for example, he wrote a discourse on Hades. And in that discourse, he offers up the oftentimes uh, used misunderstanding of the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, uh, that there's Abraham's bosom as a place where people would go in, in the Sheol realm uh, for the good folks. Uh, and then there would be a, a place of torment uh, for those not so good. Uh, and again, uh, this was different considerations of, uh, of Jewish teachings. Now, this is not what I consider biblical. This is what people began to conjure up. So uh, that being said, what we do know, though, what, we, what they agreed on was that the Hadean realm was the sort of waiting place until the time of the coming of the Lord and the judgment. What Daniel chapter 12 talks about what uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what Jesus oftentimes mentioned uh, in coming in judgment and uh, the resurrection of the dead and, and things like that. So that being said, uh, they believed that up until the coming of the Lord and that time of judgment, everybody went to the Hadean realm, the she you know, to Sheol, the grave. And it would be at that. Now, my estimation would be the the Jews would not understand how they could go straight to heaven, whereas Moses is still in a waiting place. So that's why we reread about being asleep. Those that were in Christ in that first century were asleep. And again, I'm, I don't want to get too technical here with the resurrection of the dead. I'm going to mention something about that a little bit later on. However, um, what, that's what's going on here. So what we're seeing, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on, is that once the temple is shattered, that system is shattered, the dead are resurrected, the righteous are judged and, and go to the, be in the heavenlies, the, the dead, the old covenant dead wicked are sent into, um, are sent into everlasting death and, you know, destruction. Uh, the sea, as we read in Revelation chapter 20, are judged. Now, again, I don't know how all of that works. Uh, I've written some articles on God's judgment as a past understanding. Uh, however, the point I'm making here is that this is what we're what we're reading about here. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on, is that now this, this shield, this understanding of a place between us and eternal life with God is gone. That has been taken away. And if I may direct your attention to page 177 of the uh, commentary here, Spirit and Life, I'll tell you what I shared in the book, and maybe it'll be a bit more uh, concise and clear than I'm saying it now. I want to start on uh, where it says N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright, leading English New Testament scholar, in speaking about judgment as set forth and revealed in the first century, has said the following. The whole story, the whole of the story of judgment for those who had not followed Jesus and the vindication for those who had is summed up in the cryptic but frequently repeated saying, the first shall be last, then the last first. 
In other words, when the great tribulation came on Israel, those who had followed Jesus would be delivered. And that would be the sign that Jesus had been in the right. And that in consequence, they had been in the right in following him. The destruction of Jerusalem on the one hand and the rescue of the disciples on the other would be the vindication of what Jesus had been saying throughout his ministry. And again, that's N.T. Wright in his book, Jesus and the Victory of God. So I go on to say here in the book, in my commentary, why are the dead blessed? And I share some notes from Adam Marshall, who also uh, we've shared some resources from him in regards to the beasts uh, of the first century. So why are the dead blessed? They experience relief from persecution. They receive entrance into the presence of Christ. This is a heavenly declaration regarding the status of those who die in the Lord. The details that rest and reward follow the saints is from now on highlights the glorious reality of being the new covenant, of being in the new covenant, and how it would belong to those who were in the Lord. Surely there is significance to from now on, right? So we've seen die in the Lord uh, from now on. Consider the following remark from Steve Gregg in his Revelation commentary. It is also possible that the emphasis is upon the state of those who die in the Lord after a certain point in history in which case the allusion may be to the change occasioned by the replacement of the old covenant with the new. If the fall of Jerusalem has been the subject of this chapter to this point, which again, I believe I make my case for, then it would follow naturally that this passage considers the impact in the old covenants passing upon the post-mortem experience of believers, remembering that the way into the holiest of alls had, was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing, Hebrews 9, 8. David Shilton writes, by the work of Christ, heaven has been opened to God's people. The limbus patrum, the afterlife abode of the Old Testament faithful, the bosom of Abraham of Luke 16, 22, has been unlocked and its inhabitants freed. Death is now entrance to communion in glory with Christ and the departed saints. I go on to say, uh, if you go, just turn me over to 179, right there, second paragraph down. Imagine that preterism is the only hermeneutic that truly allows for a consummated victory to be announced upon the lives of departed believers, not to mention the only consistent hermeneutic that allows for near-death experiences. Again, because we've all heard people say they went to heaven. Well, how did you go to heaven if judgment hasn't happened yet? Again, judgment happens at the fall of the city of Babylon when the Lord comes. Uh, so again, uh, preterism is the only her actual true hermeneutic to those details. What we're reading here, blessed are the Lord, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Preterism is the only view that actually gives validity to what that's saying. That after the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, there is no more uh, patron limbus, if you will, to use the Latin, a uh, place of waiting uh, before you went into the heavenly abode with Christ. Does that make sense, Edward? Amen. All right. Good deal. Um, so that's, you know, again, I want, I hope I made a good point there in regards to Revelation 14, really seeing the context being the fall of Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, so that, that's kind of what I was getting at with uh, all of my details in my commentary. The next text that I want to bring up, Edward, if you don't mind, is uh, Revelation chapter 16. verses 10 through 11, where we read, And the fifth angel poured out his bowl upon the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl upon the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up that in the way that be prepared for the kings from the east. So I brought this up because I read something in this commentary here. If you go to page 193 in Spirit and Life, and I read verses, I'm sorry, uh, verse 10 through 11, correct? Mm -hmm. it's Corinthians 16. Yeah, they know they're all right. So here it says, again, identifying those those uh, beasts, because that's what we've been talking about here. And again, identifying the beast is of utmost importance. And this goes right along 
with what Holger Neubauer was bringing up and ultimately what Johnny was pointing out as well. The throne of the beast is the land beast, the Jews, the Sanhedrin under the control of the zealots and Sakari. This darkness symbolizes the fall of the nation. Remember, the kingdom's going to become full of darkness. God was putting out their light. We have the same language used in the fall of Babylon in Isaiah 13 and the fall of Egypt in Ezekiel 32. The condition of the Jewish nation got worse and worse because they would not repent. So again, this is the, the uh, I don't know why I, I wrote that down, but it just stood out to me as something that needed to be mentioned. Uh, I guess in regards to the land beast of what Revelation 13, uh, I thought it was an important uh, point that needed to be made. And then. So when they talk about the, the sores and, and the pain, uh, that can that can refer to the, the, the last uh, sentence, uh, their condition of the Jewish nation got worse and worse and be, and they be, uh, and they would not repent. Sure. Well, again, you've done the historical study through that period, so you know some of the horrendous things that we read about in Josephus and, and different uh, historical writers regarding the Roman Jewish War. Yeah, because I'm also thinking the language could just be, you know, hy hyperbolic, you know, about, yeah. you know, this, this, the, the pain and the things of that nature that they were suffering, because they did suffer actual pain, but uh, in some cases, but you know, in regards to, you know, the sores and stuff like that, that could be hyper hyperbolic language. Sure. Know? Well, again, I, I believe, I believe most commentators would agree that what we're reading about in Revelation, the entire book is a vision, is hyperbole, a metaphor, a simile, all these different, you know, phrases of speech, uh, apocalyptic language. Now, that's what we're seeing all throughout the book of Revelation. So, uh, and even, even down to like, for example, something that's come up in discussion with my brother is what does it mean the fire from heaven? They will cause fire to come down from heaven. And if you you know the context, you know that because of what the zealots did uh, in Jerusalem and, and their, their rebellion against uh, a lot of the historical figures, Gessius Flores and others, uh, they caused the Romans to come and throw catapults of fire into the city of Jerusalem, which again would have appeared as fire coming down from heaven. So uh, you know that was an interesting historical insight to bring up. But again, the metaphor has you picturing, you know, lightning bolts or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. uh, but rather, it's it's simply the the fires coming down from heaven is the catapult. So uh, that's the it, importance of history, right? Absolutely, and again, and understanding as you're pointing out, metaphor and understanding how when we read the sores and things like that, it could just be talking about the war. The war now there might be literal, mm -hmm. you know, things, uh, but then there will also be uh, times where it's going to be a metaphor. So. If you don't mind, I want to jump over to uh, Revelation 19. This is a text you had brought up, Edward. So I'm going to let you speak a little bit about it. Revelation 19, verses 19 through 20. Mm -hmm. And this will be our last Bible text before we jump in on some uh, some other uh, part of our program, the Flashback and Flash Forward Friday uh, details here, because I know we're getting against the time. Uh, here in Revelation chapter 19, verses 19 through 20, we read, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies, assembled to make war against him who sat upon the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. And these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire and that burns with brimstone. So uh, Edward, I thought you brought up a great point there where we see correlation of this to Revelation 13. And we note that the first beast was the beast that gives authority to the second beast. And then the second beast causes people to worship the first beast. And that's ultimately what we're talking about here. That, that second beast, that land beast, ultimately is the false prophet mm -hmm. that deceives the people. And mm -hmm. again, we see, uh, hopefully you saw the correlation with the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees saying things like, we have no king but Caesar. Uh, the zealots ultimately doing the carnal works of the Romans as well and bringing forth just as beastly of a empire as the uh, Romans did. Amen. So I, I like, like I had mentioned a little bit earlier in the program, um, the, the sea beast being the Romans and the land beast being the religious leaders, um, the, the Romans giving the power to the, um, Jewish leaders um, 
and the Jewish leaders uh, given the authority to the uh, Romans uh, uh, seems to fit. Yeah, yeah, again, well, it's the, the Romans giving authority to the zealots, the zealots giving worship, in a sense, to the Romans, uh, mm -hmm. and causing the people to basically go along with the same carnal destruction. Again, Jesus Amen. said, get out of the city. You know, this is what me and my brother talked about yesterday. Jesus said, get out of the city. So I don't care if you get a revelation saying it didn't happen, or it mm -hmm. did happen. Uh, you know, that's what I think the, the, what's going on in Second Thessalonians, is that People were saying the day of the Lord had already occurred. Why? Well, if the day of the Lord has already occurred, then we don't need to flee Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. You know what? You really like your spot, man. You're comfortable there. You don't need mm -hmm. to leave, you, you know, and, and that's kind of the point. So everything that was happening, the reason why the Jews kept trying to bring people back to the Judaic religion was because, and that's the mark of the beast, if you will, Amen. because Jesus said to get out of the city. They want people to stay. They want them to, you know, cleave, let's do this. So the zealots end up doing the work of helping the Romans bring destruction upon the people of God. Again, at that time being the old covenant people. Uh, and Holger actually brings that out in his commentary on Revelation chapters uh, 12 through 13. In like the dog re returns to his vomit. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, you know, many did shrink back, unfortunately, and went back to that, you know, trusting in that Judaic system. So, uh, again, so you see that that the picture, as you just rightly noted, it fits. It fits very well, the historical scene with, and again, the reason why it works is because we did the, we did the contextual study. We went to Daniel 2, we went to Daniel 7, we went to Revelation 13, we went to also considering, of course, Matthew chapters 21 through 24, and Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 22, uh, and then, of course, now here we are at Revelation chapter 19, uh, and we're seeing the destruction of these beasts. The coming of the Lord is going to destroy these beasts and set them into confusion and send them into, uh, they'll never be successful in their endeavors against the people of God. If I may, uh, Daniel Rogers actually wrote the uh, commentary on uh, Revelation chapter 19 in the Spirit and Life Lectures. And this is what he said. It's very brief. But in regards to verses 19 and 20, he said, the beasts and the kings of the earth attempted to destroy the church the heavenly kingdom, but would be unsuccessful. Jesus had given warning to his followers 40 years previous to this event that they should leave the city and flee when they would see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. When Rome and the zealots began to fight, the Christians had already made their escape. Despite their greatest efforts, the church remained victorious. They had lost the ultimate battle against the kingdom of God. Amen. And uh, again, uh, that's the good news of, of Jesus Christ. One of the things I love on an article I had found years ago uh, was called Remember Pella. And they said that, you know, we often say to each other, God bless you. May the Lord go before you. Uh, peace of Christ. Uh, but uh, Nathan Du Bois, who wrote that article, what he had asserted was that the most encouraging thing that we could say to one another is remember Pella. Amen. You know, we've seen God's faithfulness of come mighty on behalf of his people ultimately the fulfillment of what we read there in revelation chapter 14 verse 1 so yeah i wanted to go back to 14 for a brief moment that's we cool. spoke we spoke of um zion uh because zion is how the israelites were supposed to uh conduct themselves and how they're supposed to have lived but they failed in um uh accepting the uh, surrounding nations or being influenced by the surrounding nations instead of influencing their surrounding nations. And then the purpose of the song of Moses was a reminder of the hand of G the hand of God in their lives, you know, how they were delivered from Egypt and, and the promises, you know, of Jesus being that fulfillment and things of this nature. Um, there was another point that I had wanted to raise, but, uh, you know, it kind of slips, slips my mind, but that's, that's basically the gist of it. All right. Well, amen. And if I may, um, you know, we're going to make all of these resources, these podcasts and all the resources we've brought up here uh, available on the power of preterism.wordpress.com. Uh, if I may just end uh, everything that we've talked about here with a sort of summarizing thought, and it's a summarizing thought from Ray Vanderlaan, a series that we had been uh, going through here at the Blue Point Bible Church. Matter of fact, later I might, for a flashback Friday, I might share it on my own personal social media, maybe on the Power of Preterism Network's Facebook page. So if you're on Facebook, 
please like the Power of Preterism Network's Facebook page. Help us, uh, you know, continue to bring forth clarity, healing, and strategy. And I'll share the resource. However, in regards to the Mark of the Beast, which was session four of volume five, Church History, that in the That the World May Know series that we study here on Wednesday nights at the Blue Point Bible Church, this is what Ray Vanderloan had to say about the Mark of the Beast. And it gives us applicational context to these things. For us, as for John, we too will have to choose between the world and God. Balance that with the command to love each other, and most of all, not to love the world. In the Jewish culture at that time, the word faith had many meanings. One meaning was, quote, bold persistence, unyielding intensity that would not give up, which is the same root for faith from which we get the modern word chutzpah. We readily see evidence of the Jewish understanding of faith in the ministry of Jesus and in the early Christians who were bold, determined, persistent, and unwilling to be stopped in their service to God. And again, that's where we see the contrast of the seal of God, you know, versus the mark of the beast. And uh, we each walk in uh, increasing and possessing the things of the faith, uh, the things that make us effective and fruitful in our use of the knowledge of God. Amen. Amen. So, Edward, uh, let's uh, just quickly, I know we're against the hour here, but I want to just bring us in on a, a Friday tradition for the Preterist Power Hour, which is going to be a flashback and flash forward Friday. It uh, gives us opportunity to bring up uh, announcements, resources, conferences, et cetera. And I have an order that I'm hoping we might go in. So I think that uh, in regards to announcements, let's always start with events and conferences. So things that we know are coming up and then conclude with some resources. And then that'll be our way to kind of sum up the show is providing resources and things to come and uh, ending the program uh, from that point forward. Sound good? Yes. All right. So uh, events and conferences, if you don't mind, Edward, I'll just lead in on the topic. And if you want to jump in uh, and add anything at the conclusion, uh, please feel free to do so. Okay. Yes. So uh, one thing I want to let everybody know is the Power of Preterism Network. Again, if you visit powerofpreterism.com, uh, that's where we have information about that, uh, about our effort. Uh, right now, we've developed our cooperative board. I'm pleased to say that Edward himself is, uh, Edward Howell is a member of our cooperative board. Dr. Cindy Coates from the Porch Ministry in Atlanta, Georgia, is a part of our cooperative board. Jonathan Buttry, pastor of Holston Primitive Baptist Universalist Church, uh, is a member of our board. Uh, Chris Lombardi, uh, father, Bible teacher, and uh, Diligent Man of God is a member of our board, and uh, I'm, I'm missing one more name. Who am I missing, Edward? Um, I don't know. I uh, just remember Cindy Coates. <laughs> so it's Cindy, Jonathan, Jonathan Buffy, Chris, and yourself. So uh, that is actually the, the full board there, uh, and of course, we're going to uh, renew our board every year. Uh, each board member has contributed to a six-month goal. Uh, that'll be exciting to see as we advance our effort of bringing clarity, healing, and strategy to the things of preterism. We have various ministries uh, to promote. We have Team Preterist, which is a network of preterists that are determined to work together to advance fulfilled truth, despite our differences in doctrines and denominations and differences in that regard. Uh, again, making the, the, the fruit of uh, fulfillment, ultimately our focus. Uh, so that's Team Preterist. Then we have the Preterist Preachers Network, which again is a uh, monthly effort of conference calls and a blog site. If you visit, I believe it's the Preterist Pastors blog .wordpress.com. Uh, again, all of this is available at powerofpreterism.com. Uh, if you visit the website there, you'll get information about our monthly conference calls. And then we also have a, a fellowship uh, a sort of weekly thing where each person within that network calls other preachers and sort of stays in touch. So we're looking to do a lot through that. We have Reformation Now, and we have the uh, this right here, which you're tuned into, the Preterist Power Hour. So those are our four efforts of ministry that we're currently working on and advancing. Uh, obviously, more to come as each person uh, involves themselves with their six-month goal. Uh, and then also uh, tonight, as I've already made mention, and I'll just throw up on the screen one more time, uh, I'll be participating in a discussion with Sean Griffin on his program, Kingdom in Context. That's at 8 p.m. Uh, we'll be talking about, has the day of the Lord already happened? Uh, obviously, you know my position, it has. So uh, I'll be talking with him uh, in that regard. And then um, another uh, conference that's happening, I wanna mention a conference actually uh, this year, will be in March, the Spring Conference at the Holston 
Primitive Baptist Universalist Church. I'm pleased to say that I am one of the speakers for that conference. And if you put your uh, attention to the screen, I'll go ahead and share the graphic. Uh, there it is. This will be in Holston, uh, or actually Rogersville, Tennessee. Uh, there's the address, 598 Reno Street, Rogersville, Tennessee. And it's going to be from March 26th to the 27th. That's a Saturday and a Sunday. Uh, 27th does happen to be Mother's Day. Uh, just to let everybody know. However, uh, I'll be speaking on Saturday at 6 p.m., March 26th, and we'll be rethinking the resurrection. And obviously, I'll be sharing about the corporate body view and uh, helping advance some ideas in that regard. Uh, you have Daniel Rogers, who's also going to be speaking with me that Saturday evening. Or no, I'm sorry, he'll be speaking on Saturday morning uh, on March 26th. And then Jonathan Buttrey himself, will be a speaker among other speakers that I don't personally know. However, I look forward to uh, hearing their thoughts and being a part of uh, thinking through the things of our faith with them in that regard. So that is March 26th through 27th in Rogersville, Tennessee. Uh, hopefully uh, you can plan to come on out and join with us for that session. I imagine it will be edifying. Also, just to let you know, one last thing in regards to uh, events and conferences that I know of, uh, and of course we encourage people to either email me uh, post them on Facebook, uh, just message the Power of Preterism Network in any way that you can, and let us know about announcements and resources so we can make them available each Friday uh, specifically. But we'll make them as available as much as we can, but we'll focus in on announcements every Friday. Uh, last thing I'll make mention of is somewhere between the months of February and April, there's a conference going to be planned in Mississippi. If anybody's familiar with Tony Gallup, who pastors a church there in Mississippi. I'm forgetting the name of the town right off the top of my head right now. Uh, however, uh, we're working on a conference between February to April. Uh, me and Ward Fenley will be two speakers that will be there. So we're working on uh, some details in that regard uh, for that conference. So we'll keep you uh, informed so that you might know what's going on in regards to these conferences. Edward, do you have any announcements in regards to events and conferences or any questions in regards to anything that I might have just shared? No, it's just that um, hopefully that they, they will be live, the uh, conferences in Tennessee, Mississippi, and uh, the other, the, I think you mentioned another place, but I, I know this evening, you know, I'll be tuned in. You know, I have my alarm set, set five minutes prior you know, <laughs> and you know, one thing I appreciate about you, Edward, is you were one of the first people to begin preaching, uh, uh, praying for our online community at the Blue Point Bible Church. And uh, I appreciate that you brought that up, obviously showing your care and concern for the online community there. Uh, and what I would say is, um, yes, tonight will be online, of course, and then I will work toward uh, the best of my ability, making sure, and I'm sure Jonathan Buttree and Tony Gallup as well, will be working toward making everything available as live stream, uh, and I'll keep everybody informed. Now that we've mentioned it here on the Preterist Power Hour, you can look to the Power of Preterism Network to make those things available to you online as well as in person. So thank you for bringing that up, Edward. Uh, lastly, I'll just bring up some resources. Let's jump in on that. Uh, obviously, we mentioned the power of preterism.wordpress.com at least 10 times every program. Why? Because that's where we put all of our resources. Uh, there's so many different things that are there available on the blog. Uh, so Mark of the Beast is going to be a running resource uh, that we'll have available there. Uh, we obviously are waiting on Johnny Ova's article that will be added to that discussion uh, when he publishes that. We've mentioned Spirit and Life book, uh, 2018, the uh, commentary on Revelation as a resource. Uh, of course, tomorrow, uh, somebody's going to get a message from me thanking them for sharing the posts and, uh, and that they get a free copy of that book. So still be sharing it and you'll be uh, one of the people at random that will be chosen to get a copy. Also, I want to make mention of Clarity and Revelation, a study guide that I've put together uh, on the book of Revelation. Um, we're going to do a study group this year. Uh, one of the nights during the week, uh, sort of like we did through my book, Wicked, uh, we're going to do a study through Clarity and Revelation as well. So uh, I want to encourage people to keep your eye out for that. It'll most likely be offered through the Power of Preterism Network, uh, and uh, we'll make sure you get uh, those resources as well. Currently, you could buy the study guide, uh, Clarity and Revelation. If you go to Amazon, you could buy it for about $10, and it's just the study guide. And what it's meant to do is accompany your study through Revelation chapters 1 through 22. And I have sermon, a sermon series available 
uh, at bluepointbiblechurch.org, where I had preached through the book of Revelation. And those were my study, the outline that I had provided to the congregation. And uh, you can find all of that, you know, the, those sermons on the church website. However, we're looking to do an actual study group uh, later this year. So I'll breathe for a second. And then I got a couple other resources, uh, unless you have some you want to jump in and mention, Edward. No, continue, please. All right, cool. All right. So you ready? I'm going to speak fast because I know we're up against the time here. So uh, Don Preston, Don Preston continues to do morning musings. Uh, he is currently going through the Olivet Discourse. So if that's an area of study uh, that you want to lean in on, I encourage you to visit Don Preston's Morning Musings on YouTube. Just find Don Preston and you can uh, watch his Morning Musings there. The current topic is the Olivet Discourse. However, I also noticed that he did a video today uh, going through N.T. Wright, as I just mentioned, N.T. Wright in my commentary, uh, N.T. Wright uh, and how he's wrong in regards to his view on redemption of creation. Those of you that know N.T. Wright know he's a futurist, so you know that he uh, obviously has a view of the redemption of creation being something yet future uh, and has something to do with the physical planet rather than uh, the redemption of the creation of Romans chapter 8, the people of God. So uh, I encourage you to visit Don Preston's Morning Musings to learn a little bit more about that topic. Mentioning Don, of course, you have to bring up Fulfilled Radio. Him and uh, Daniel Rogers have been doing uh, the Two Guys in a Bible uh, for a while now, and they've been going into the topic of the Messianic Temple. More recently, they did a resource on the Messianic Temple and the modern view of the church. I haven't had opportunity to, uh, to listen to that. However, I don't know how somebody can read that and not be interested to wonder what is they, what are they going to say. So I want to encourage everybody to go over to Fulfilled Radio. All you have to do is put it in Google, and you'll be able to get those resources. I noticed something else that was interesting on that site that leans in on what we're talking about here that was... Uh, they provided an overview of the book of Daniel. See, Edward's doing the right thing. He figured it out. He said, oh, I got to get pen and paper. Uh, you know, this guy's giving announcements. I want to encourage you on Fridays, bring a pen and paper to our program here. Um, Fulfilled Radio, the Messianic Temple, and they also have an overview on the book of Daniel. And again, we've been talking about the book of Daniel uh, on this program since we've been talking about the Mark of the Beast. So you definitely want to go over there and visit Fulfilled Radio and lean in on some of their resources. As I mentioned, Fulfilled Radio, you ready for this, Edward? There's something yeah. I have to say. We have to say happy birthday to Daniel Rogers. Uh, Boy, Dave, Dave. Rogers yeah. birthday, And also uh, his son, Caden's birthday. Uh, yeah. You know, they both share a birthday. How beautiful is that? And that being said, Daniel Rogers recently renamed his website, his blog site. He used to have labornotinvain.com. Now his website is simply danielr.net. So you just go to danielr.net. And you can get all of his resources. He shared a resource today about uh, his birthday and, you know, with his, his son, sharing a birthday with his son. I encourage you to go ahead and read that uh, just to obviously be blessed by his thoughts. But Daniel's resources continue to be a blessing. So I think that's a resource to make mention of here. Uh, Gary DeMar, while not a full preterist, he has an amazing blog. Uh, if you just simply look up Gary DeMar podcast on Google, uh, he has quite a few different ones just to wet your senses. Uh, I noticed he posted a uh, podcast on principles in debate uh, more recently. I said, oh, I have to go ahead and listen to that one. And then leaning in on this study right here, The Mark of the Beast, he has a podcast called Reading Revelation for the First Time. And obviously going to help you understand some foundational principles regarding the book of Revelation. So two things that I have to just say right now would be if you were to leave this podcast and you say, you know, I really need to get to the bottom of this Mark of the Beast stuff, where I would encourage you to start if you've been following along and you feel maybe we didn't answer everything for you. Two other resources you could lean in on is listen to the overview of Daniel by Fulfilled Radio, and then listen to Reading Revelation for the First Time by Gary DeMar. Use those as foundational resources to your study. And then uh, lastly, I just want to make mention, obviously, we're moving into the weekend. We're not going to be doing the Preterist Power Hour during the weekend. We hope that your studies continue through the weekend, of course. Uh, many people wonder where they can gather with a local congregation as a preterist. Uh, we're working on the Preterist Preachers Network. And of course, Tony Denton continues to have a resource of preterist congregations throughout the United States. Uh, if you're interested in that, please email me at Pastor Mike Miano, M I A N O, at yahoo.com, and I'll go ahead and get that resource to you um, to find a congregation in your local area. However, there are churches, a part of our network that do their services online. Blue Point Bible Church, 
uh, whenever we have no, uh, Edward is my, uh, my live stream guy. And whenever uh, we have no problem there setting it up to go live, we try to go live 1030 on Sunday mornings uh, with our worship service here at the Blue Point Bible Church. And that stream through the Blue Point Bible Church's Facebook page. And then uh, Daniel Rogers is obviously a co-minister there at uh, North Broad Church. He's been sharing some uh, links to his church uh, there on his Facebook page. So if you simply go to Google and put in North Broad, Broad, North Broad Church in Alabama, uh, the website will come up. And of course, they stream their services. So you can be blessed by that. And then Holston Primitive Baptist Universalist Church, where I mentioned the sp uh, spring conference coming up. They have been recording their services and putting them online. I'm not exactly sure what time they stream them. However, you can simply look up Holston, H-O-L-S-T-O-N-P-B-U, and find information regarding their services and how you might tune in, being from wherever you are. And then the porch in Atlantis, Dr. Cindy Coates, she streams her uh, services through her Facebook page, The Porch, and uh, they stream their worship services on Sunday evenings. Uh, and again, they have many different streams that they share. And then, of course, it would be remiss not to mention Berean Bible Church, uh, BereanBibleChurch.org, Pastor David Curtis. His resources have been foundational to my journey into preterism. Uh, so again, they have a live stream they make available. He even types up and makes available his written sermons. Uh, so a lot to be edified by uh, every weekend uh, in that regard. And lastly, and I'm going to breathe. The last announcements I'll make mention of is a, uh, a review that I'm posting in regards to 2021. I mentioned it yesterday, have not completed it, looking to complete it as soon as we're done with this program here. Uh, and I'll be posting that on social media and making it available on my personal blog site, mianogonewild.wordpress.com. So that's the announcements. Uh, Edward, uh, we're uh, up against the time. I am going to unmute everybody here in a moment just to let them sort of summarize some things from our, our guests that have joined with us in regards to the Mark of the Beast and or uh, announcements, resources, events, comments, questions, etc. cetera. Uh, but before I do so, I want to encourage everyone, tune in this coming Monday at 11 a.m. to the Preterist Power Hour. Again, Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, what we're looking to do in the weeks to come is we're looking to do a review of the second exodus, uh, the theme of the second exodus in scripture. We're looking to bring on uh, Robert Cruikshank and also Daniel Rogers. They both have resources in that uh, regard, uh, maybe even Dr. Don K. Preston. We want to bring on Dr. Don K. Preston to return back to a topic that we had previously talked about, the change in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, so uh, we're going to be reaching out to him, having him join us one of these mornings. And then, of, of course, also we want to lean in on the topic of leadership and strategy within preterism. So what we're going to do is each of our board members are going to have a, a night of interview and discussion in regards to leadership or a morning, I'm sorry, uh, in regards to a um, leadership and strategy in regards to preterism. So that will be myself, Edward, Dr. Cindy Coach, Jonathan Buttry, Chris Lombardi, uh, you know, all of us will be, uh, will be here. And uh, we'll be talking through that. And then also the elders here at the Blue Point Bible Church or the leadership committee here at the Blue Point Bible Church. Uh, I'm looking to bring them on and have them share some thoughts with us as well. So, uh, again, some exciting stuff to come uh, and that and more uh, here on the Preterist Power Hour. So I'm unmuting mics if anybody wants to jump in. Uh, Mark of the Beast topic, uh, announcements, questions, comments, et cetera, please. And if you're unmuted, please jump on in. Okay. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, I have a question about the zealots okay. because uh, this is this is a subject that, to me, it's a little hard to find some information on that is you know really historically tied into the particular period that we're talking about. Uh, I've pretty much been raised with the idea that the zealots were basically uh, just as much against Rome as Israel, you know, the, the rest of Israel was, but they were much more militant. They were the militants. Uh, now I'm starting to read stuff that seems to indicate that, you know, the, the zealots were all over the place. Do, do you have a resource that concisely gives a historical account of what the zealots were and did during the time period that we're focused on? Yeah, so the two things I think that are uh, good to lean in on that study would be Josephus's book, Thrones of Blood, and also um, Ed Stevens' book, The Final Decade Before the End. Okay, thank you. Those would be the two. And again, just to speak to that, I would say, and I hear you in that regard, 
a good point to make about the zealots, how, you know, again, they did, they were throwing Rome off their back. So we, we do see that in, in that regard, they were not with Rome. However, from a, let's say a God's eye view, uh, they were teamed up with Rome in regards to carnality. And they were bringing the a carnal, carnal beastly, if you will, uh, rule upon the people of God, or at least trying to persecution, oppression, et cetera. And they were all a part of that, that sort of system. So while they were throwing Rome off their back, they were in cahoots, in a sense, with them as well. Okay, thanks. Any other thoughts, questions, comments, announcements, resources, anybody would like to bring up? Hey, Michael. Hey, Zach. Um, first of all, I would just like to thank you both, um, you and Edward, for um, doing this, moving to five days a week um, seems like a big sacrifice, but uh, I have been definitely been edified and challenged um, by it. And I, I'm just very thankful for both of you in doing that. Um, I do have a question about Revelation 14, the passage that you brought up about um, blessed uh, are those who die in the Lord from now on. The, the next part, I believe, says um, for their deeds, follow them or something to that effect. Um, do you have an idea of what that um, second clause is getting at? Yeah, I, again, I, I could I could kind of lean in on what I would say it means, but I don't know that I would I have an exegetical answer. I mean, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow with them. So again, what we're saying is, who are those that are dying in the Lord during this fall of Babylon or during this time of, I would argue, persecution, right? So that you're seeing mm -hmm. uh, they've been persecuted, and that's how those who were dying in the Lord prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, they were being persecuted. So they would per be persecuted, and then they would go to a, a time of sleep or a time of rest, and then they would await the time of judgment and then they would go to rest with God. However, now, post-destruction, those who die in the Lord, their, their deeds go with them immediately. They don't wait. You see what I'm saying? If you're righteous, you're not, you're not going to the same place that the unrighteous are going. Rather, your deeds follow you. You go right to a uh, heavenly, uh, you know, you don't have to wait a time of judgment. If you were righteous and, you, you know, you had that mark, your deeds as a righteous person follow you. Now, again, hopefully we I'd know that we're not talking about our deeds per se. Uh, we're as Christians, we would hopefully identify with Christ's deeds. Um, so our deeds are our Christ's deeds, and they will follow us when we physically die, biologically die, uh, so that we will have an eternal re reality. We don't have to wait. So again, what I see happening here in verse 13 is a text against the uh, dying and having to go to a place of waiting and then going to heaven. What's happening is now that that text that you're pointing out there, that they may rest from their labors and their deeds may follow with them, means that it, their identity, their their state in Christ, their fruit in Christ is following with them as they biologically die. They're not going to get dumped into the same place, unfortunately, where everybody else is waiting for the time of judgment. Hopefully that made sense. Yeah. I, would you say that their labors in some sense, continued for them before the destruction of the temple? Like, it seems like it's saying they get rest after the de destruction of the, the temple. Um, right. Do you understand uh, what I'm asking? I think so. And my, my point would be that if you died prior to uh, AD 70 and you were in the Lord, mm -hmm. you would go to the Sheol realm and wait. Mm -hmm. for your reward now if you die in the lord after the destruction of the temple your deeds follow you now again they followed them in, in later on but they didn't follow them immediately here you were you're a righteous person but now you're you're waiting just like the unrighteous person is mm -hmm. whereas now you and i uh, if we're in the lord i would say that our deeds follow us meaning we do not go anywhere to wait for a yet future judgment amen if, if I get what you're saying, it's basically that those that died prior to 70 AD, right, they were in, 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 in the place of waiting 
And then after um, uh, the temple had fallen and the city was destroyed, they, they were gathered into the body of Christ. And being that were those that uh, died after 70 AD, uh, when Jesus said, um, you believe in me, uh, you'll never die, you'll pass from death to life. So therefore, after the temple went down, um, they, they were just translated from, you know, because we, they have everlasting life. So, you know, it's like absent from the body, present with the Lord. Yeah, again, I think the I key, I, was that ever? No, I wasn't sure. I was just, you know, throwing it out there. Yeah, I agreed with most of what you said. I would just disagree with the, uh, I'd be careful with the absent with the, from the body is to be present with the Lord text. Um, mm -hmm. However, uh, what we do see here is, um, again, exactly what you had said. I, prior to the destruction, there was a time of waiting. After the destruction, there's no more waiting. So, you know, that's why I said preterism is the only hermeneutic that actually validates where people say, you know, that their loved ones died and went to heaven. You know, yeah, because there's no more waiting. Absolutely. Blessed yeah. are those who die in the Lord from now on. From when? The destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, whereas, uh, and then also people that say they have near-death experiences and they went to heaven. Now, while I might not agree with them, or, you know, I, I try not to make it my business to disagree with people's personal uh, presuppositions. Uh, however, uh, the only way that can be valid would be through a preterist hermeneutic. So, Zach, hopefully uh, what we're saying is, is responding to a bit of what your question is and uh, helping you get a better understanding of uh, what I might say, at least uh, what it means that their, their rest would follow them is that rather than having it to have to wait for the, the fruit of their, their labor, they get to go right into it uh, upon biological death upon their, you know, when they die. And that is part of the, uh, the, the, uh, the hope of Israel is to enter into God's rest. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Did it clarify a bit or do you, did you still have uh, some thoughts that you feel like we need to kind of hammer home a bit? Well, I, I'm i trying to understand what, what the position, not even the position, um, what the experience of the dead before the destruction of the temple seems like it's suggesting that their deeds did not follow them and that they didn't have rest from their labors. And now that um, the temple is destroyed, that they're, they've entered into the situation where they're resting from their labors um, and their deeds are following them. And I'm just, I guess my question is, it, it seems to not be talking about waiting so much as like a different um, situation for the, the dead before the temple was destroyed. Um, and I don't know that I have an answer for that. I just, um, it doesn't seem to be talking about waiting, although I think that's an element of what happened um, in Sheol. But I, I guess, how, how does it, how does it, these two clauses about, you know, rest from labors and deeds following um, the dead, how does, how does that relate to Sheol? Um, I'm glad he mentioned that because I had a question about that as well. But my, not, not that I have a question, my answers may, may be off, but that's why I kind of wanted to bring it to your attention, what he kind of described. Because the dead in Christ, okay, they were dead and waiting for judgment. The sleep, okay, I think these are just definitions of the the people's uh okay like like okay if you were to say the dead you're talking about those that died in, under the law when you talk about the sleep those were the ones that died in Christ um and then when you talk about the uh the ones that are alive they were alive and they were just changed from the old covenant um way of thinking to the new covenant way of thinking am I correct in that regard well, all right. So I don't know what you're getting at then, but you're correct as far as what I would assert. Yes, that's that's what I teach. Yeah. But I'm not sure what you're you're exactly getting at, what your question would be. Okay. Basically, um, I would go back to what 
this gentleman was asking about prior to 70 AD, how would you describe um, the, you know, their state? Um, right. Okay. Okay. Well, I understood his question. So let me just respond to that then. Okay. So um, now, Zach, uh, I, what I would do is obviously we're not going to be able to get into all of that right now. However, what I, I think there are some resources that we can lean in on to get a bit of an understanding as to what the Jews believed about uh, what they believed about death prior to the time of the coming of the Lord, the time of the Messiah and the judgment. So I think that would be a, a good foundation. Now, as I mentioned before, the discourse on Hades by Josephus, uh, what that requires is developing an understanding of how the, Helen, the, uh, the Greeks began to influence Jewish thought as well. Uh, that's why within rabbinical thought, there's a lot of difference as to what happens with a, uh, a Jew after death, what they believe happens after a biological death. So uh, it's a hard topic to really lean in on. Uh, I've obviously let in, I'm an annihilationist, so I tend to believe that uh, those outside of God, those things that are outside of God don't exist at all. Uh, they just die. So uh, that, you know, and then if you're, you don't have the spirit of God because you're in Hades, you're not in a time of resting. You're in a time of waiting, which again, to me is the antithesis of uh, resting. Resting, the opposite would be waiting. So I do see that. And I, maybe I need to uh, help that lean in on that study of that text a bit more to maybe make that case. Uh, however, that's where I do stand. And uh, I can definitely continue some dialogue with you and maybe even work towards some future programs where we can lean in on that topic a bit further. Does that sound good? Okay. Briefly, briefly, what you just stated, is that's, that's, that's basically my point as far as um, how you said they're waiting, they're, they're sleeping, or however. Um, is that like a definition because they're dead? They're dead, but it's just defining who the actual people are that are waiting. I, I don't know if I'm saying it clearly enough. All right. Well, again, I, I, hopefully what I said made sense. And that's. You know, yes, that's, it did. Uh, that's basically it. Just, let me just hold to what you said. <laughs> um, Zach, did that, uh, does that sound good to you? It does. And again, thank you guys uh, so much. You're very welcome. Vicki, I'm not sure that you jumped in. I wasn't sure if you wanted to take a moment to say anything. So I want to give you that, that moment. No, it's okay, Pastor. All I right. Digest. <laughs> Amen. Yes, again, we, we have a lot here. And, and this is by no means an easy resource, but it doesn't, uh, easy topic, but it also doesn't yeah. need to be a confusing topic. So uh, to kind of bring our show to a close here, uh, what I'll say is hopefully we gave you uh, some resources to further study. Uh, that's the first thing. The first thing that we have to say is you have to study. You, you know, if you're if you're just sitting in your room and you're watching t the movie The Omen and you're conjuring up your best idea of what 666 means, uh, that's not going to help anybody nor yourself. So the first thing you have to do is actually be studying these things through. Uh, the second thing we would say is in your study, you have to consider context. You have to go back to the, the context of Daniel. You have to go back to the context of Jesus. You have to go back to the context of the book of Revelation. And you have to consider cultural details. You have to consider uh, historical details. These are all important parts of study. Uh, you, you know, get a study friend, a buddy, an accountability partner, uh, get a Bible study class, get a pastor, whatever you want to do. But, you know, get around a group of people that are studying these things with you. We'll hold you accountable. We'll encourage you. Tune into the Preterist Power Hour. We'd love to be that study group for you. Uh, join us here on Zoom. Watch with us on Facebook Live, however you choose to join with us. Uh, these are all important, important parts of this, this puzzle of the mark of the beast or, or any biblical uh, interpretational detail. Uh, then, uh, obviously, what we leaned in on was outside of context, you have to start allowing your time statements to mean what they mean. So, you know, for me, uh, this study, matter of fact, if I may just get to the front of my notes here, I wrote down context, text, time texts. So if you want to order, consider the context first study, obviously, as I said before, get into the context, figure out what texts are talking about the topic, as we marked out for you, Daniel chapter two, Daniel chapter seven, Revelation chapters 13 through 14, Revelation chapter 19, uh, Matthew chapter 21 through 24. Luke chapter 21. These are important texts to be studying through on this topic. And then 
time statements. You have to let the time statements mean what they mean. In first uh, Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple, and then he begins to tell them signs of when this is going to occur. And he says, this will be the time that was spoken of by Daniel. Uh, we have to consider that. And Daniel said his things were for a time far off. That was about 500 years before the ministry of Christ. So that was a time far off. And then if Revelation is saying they were going to happen soon, that means that the details within Revelation had to have happened uh, within 500 years. And if you need another time statement, which we mentioned, Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 22, Jesus said it would be the time of the, the, the surrounding of the city of Jerusalem by armies uh, would be the, the time of uh, the, the fulfillment of all that was written. And I hope that when we marked out the beast, the only thing that makes sense is considering the first century. So, uh, and then of course, then we have all these resources that we've put together for you at the power of preterism.wordpress.com. So, uh, and we'll continue to do that. Anybody that sends me resources, uh, we'll put them up on the, obviously they'll be vetted for clarity. Uh, you know, I'm not just throwing up any willy nilly uh, posts on the mark of the beast. Otherwise there'd be no end to posting them. Uh, however, uh, what we are doing is, is just sort of going through the resources and if they're clarifying and they lean in on the way that we've, uh, we've put this together, or if they disagree with us and give us clarity, at least as I posted the seven day Adventist study and my notes, I didn't necessarily agree with everything that was asserted, but I thought it was a good study resource. So, uh, that's, that's my summary, Edward. Uh, if you have anything you want to say, just in sort of, I just wanted to share real fast what you and D Johnny Ober had mentioned, what you had mentioned as far as having a zeal by knowledge. And Daniel and Johnny Ober has stated that um, just because you're being educated by someone uneducated me doesn't mean that you're educated. Hmm. <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. Good stuff. And matter of fact, that being said, you know, let me, I'm going to close this out and I'm going to uh, use another quote from Johnny Ober where he said that uh, the church needs to get away from the church. Uh, you know, so I want to encourage everybody get around somebody that's not a part of the church today and maybe share with them what you learned about the mark of the beast this week uh, and encourage them to tune in uh, maybe next week at 11 a.m. Be a part of our session some way, somehow. Amen. Amen. Well, Edward, thank you for uh, being with me. I thank each of you, Zach. I thank you, Richard. I thank Vicki. I thank those of you that are tuned in through Facebook Live. Uh, thank you for being a part of our time this whole week. And uh, we know that this time uh, is lifted up for the glory of God. Amen. I'll just close with a closing benediction that we uh, use in our common prayer time and trust that each of you will have a God glorifying weekend. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders that he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Go in peace. God bless Amen. you. God bless.